Revelation 14 is where we're at this evening. We saw uh, the last couple weeks in our study the beast from the sea and the beast from the earth. We have tried to suggest uh, in historical context what those might mean. And so uh, we have seen in chapter 13 the enemies. In chapter 14, now we're going to see the victory. And so John will not dwell at length on the nature of the adversary. Chapter 13 is sufficient. We're going to see uh, again, however, the picture of the empire in uh, chapter 17. Uh, But most of the second half of the book is devoted to discussion of judgment and destruction, not the nature of the enemy. And there's probably a good reason for that. Uh, It is useless really to dwell on the power of the enemy because in the end he is going to be destroyed. It's not like there is an even match between God and Satan. However, it is a real threat to the early Christians. They need to be aware of what they're up against. And so chapter 13 described for them the enemy and all of its hideous evil. But the good news is that God is going to destroy it and overcome it, and God's people are going to be safe if they will remain faithful. And so that is the picture that we're going to see now here in uh, chapter 14 and following. And uh, we saw a lot of sequences of sevens in the book, uh, in the first part of the book. There is actually a series of sevens in this part of the book, going through chapter 15 and verse 4, they are all introduced by the phrase, and I saw, or the word, uh, the phrase, I beheld. And we're going to see bowls of wrath, seven bowls of wrath in chapter 16. So John does not completely get away from that, uh, but there is less of that perhaps in this second part of the book than there was in the first. There is also another interesting shift uh, that happens at this point. We noted in chapters uh, 11, 12, 13 that the imagery there is thick with pagan background. We saw, for example, an image of a temple opened in heaven, which Roman readers would have understood as an allusion to the temple in uh, Rome that was kept open in times of war. We've noted the uh, allusions to the emperor called the Roman Empire in chapter 13. Uh, However, in chapter 14, the imagery changes to that of the Old Testament. There aren't any pagan images in chapter 14 that I'm aware of. John is taking all of his imagery from scenes of victory in the Old Testament. And so there is kind of this shift from the imagery of the world to the imagery of heaven. Uh, Be that as it may then, in chapter 14, verse 1, John says, Then I looked... And behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. Well, of course, we know who these people are. The 144,000 were the people that we met back in chapter 7. Uh, They were described as 144,000 in the first part of the chapter, and then there was a great multitude in the second part of the chapter. Remember, we suggested that that is the same group of people, that it is a before and after picture of the same group, marked for protection and then victorious after it's all over. Uh, This 144,000 here there is no doubt that it is the same group of people. And we have suggested in our study of the book of Revelation that we're not looking at chronology here. And so if somebody's wondering, well, how could this be the same group if we're seven chapters later? Well, this is not a chronological story. Remember, it's, it's like different pictures of the same event. John is telling us the same message over and over again. So it shouldn't surprise us if we see something in one picture that pops up in another one as well. And that's what we have here. Uh, This group of God's people. And remember that uh, counting in the Old Testament, you take a census in Israel when you're about to do what? Anybody remember? Go to war, yeah. And so the fact that they have been counted reminds us again that these are a warring people, a people who are at war with evil, 
Not physical warfare, John has made that very clear in chapter 13, but spiritual warfare, a test of faith, a test of faithfulness. And so here are these people equipped to go through the difficulty, and they have, uh, as their leader, the Lamb, uh, they have been marked as well. Uh, Before we get to that marking, however, um, it says here that uh, the Lamb is standing there on Mount Zion, And it's interesting, we saw the false kind of lamb in chapter 13. There was the beast that came up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. Remember that he is a pretender, a messianic pretender, one who pretends to be a savior. And I remind you of the fact that the Roman emperors were very often called savior. He pretends to be that. He would like to be thought of like that, but he's not. He spoke like a dragon, John told us. But here's the real lamb, the real savior, the real Messiah. And his position is interesting. He's not rising up out of the earth or out of the sea. This is not something that the world produced that came up from men. But here is the lamb standing above this vast empire of the world, and over it. And so he is standing above this, having been elevated and exalted, and also having conquered and will conquer this enemy. It is, in a sense, beneath his feet. And I do believe that uh, there is a strong allusion here to Psalm 2, verses 6 through 12. And I've said before on other occasions, and will remind you again, that this is one of the most important psalms for the early Christians that this is one of the clearest references to the Messiah in all of the Old Testament. You remember the psalm starts off, Why are the nations in an uproar and the people devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth have taken their stand against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us cast off their fetters and let us be free from them. God, in response, laughs at their silly notion that they can be godless and and rule themselves. God's response is, as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. And then we have the words of the Messiah himself. I will tell, tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son today. I have begotten you. Ask of me, I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the ends of the earth as your possession The Lord says to him, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Verse 12, do homage to the son that he not become angry and you perish in the way for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Uh, This allusion to God's anointed one standing on Mount Zion, installed, reigning there, appointed by God's decree, calls it to mind this psalm and its picture of the Messiah destroying all rival kingdoms. And not just rival kingdoms, but especially hostile rival kingdoms. That's the first four verses of that psalm, that they are gathered against the Lord and His anointed, saying, we're not going to submit to them. Well, the Lord is going to show who has the power. And uh, we look at Psalm 2, And uh, it might make us wonder, well, what is that psalm about? Well, it is about the exaltation of the Messiah, of Jesus going to heaven after his death and taking his seat at the right hand of God. And it will ultimately be fulfilled when Jesus raises all the dead. He is in the process of destroying all enemies. Rome was one of them. And so the destruction of the Roman Empire is a fulfillment of Psalm 2, but not necessarily the only or unique or final fulfillment of Psalm 2. But the early Christians certainly could look at it and see in it a promise that God was going to deliver them. He stands on Mount Zion, and if you know your Old Testament prophecies, Zion is kind of a code word for the Messianic age, that when God speaks about Zion, he's talking about the Messianic age and the Messianic people. And they have these, this 144,000 here, have his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. We saw in chapter 13 that the beast gave a mark on their right hand or on their forehead so that nobody could get along in that society without it. 
Well, the Lord says, I mark my people too. And they're the ones that are going to be safe as the wicked empire is destroyed. Then John says in verse 2, I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps, and they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. And so John is looking at this scene, the Lamb and this great people that are with him in this scene of victory, and The picture of verse 1 is that they are on Mount Zion too, that they are reigning with him, that they are going to be the victors, joined in the reign of Jesus. And he hears this great and mighty sound of praise because of the size of the multitude singing it. And if it reminds us of the throne scene from chapters 4 and 5, it is supposed to remind us of that. We have again here um, the mention of the four living creatures and the elders who were before the throne of God. And so the picture is of heaven. And God and his people and his Messiah, they're all gathered together now. And there is this great anthem of praise that is being sung And, of course, in the book of Revelation, singing is always joyous. People don't sing the blues in the book of Revelation. They always sing victory songs. And that's what we have here as well. Uh, Now, this is a, a very strong hint as the book runs on towards its end of what we're going to see more and more. We're going to see in chapter 15 another great eruption of praise, and then again in chapter 19, this great chorus of praise because of victory. And this theme of victory and conquest and uh, destruction of their enemy is going to get more and more emphatic as we get toward the end of the book. And we're going to hear less and less about the enemy and more and more about the victory. But here's the first kind of glimpse of it. And you'll notice that John doesn't describe what happened. Uh, We see the enemy in chapter 13, and our mind is kind of geared to think, okay, what happens next? And what did this beast do to the saints? And how long did it take? And where did this happen? John doesn't even talk about all that. He says, let me take you to the end of the story and show you how it turns out. Praise God's people singing with joy because they have been rescued and delivered. And we think, yeah, but what about the persecution? What went on? And and the point is, it doesn't matter. That's that's not not a, a concern. The fact is that God's going to rescue these people, and they're going to be safe, and they're going to be with him in the end, singing God's praise. Uh, There is an echo here of Psalm uh, 98 in verse 1, O sing to the Lord a new song. We're told here that they are singing a new song. For he has done wonderful things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained the victory for him. I've often wondered about this new song, why it's called a new song. And what I think I understand about that is that it is a new song because it's a new situation. Uh, that these are not like the psalms that Israel sang of what God did in the past. You know, some of the psalms in the book of Psalms recall God destroying the Egyptians at the Red Sea and those kinds of things. And they sing about the past. But these people aren't singing about the past. They're singing about their own experience, about what God did for them, about a new deliverance that God has brought about. And so it seems to me that that may be the explanation here of the new song. It's a new song because it's talking about a new subject. And God, just like of old, has done uh, great things and won the victory for his people, as the psalm would suggest. Uh, Also in the background here is Psalm 149. You'll notice in verse 4 there, well, uh, it starts off in verse 1, Sing to the Lord a new song. 
And then look in verse 4. The Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the afflicted ones with salvation. Let the godly ones exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the judgment written. For this is an honor for all his godly ones. Praise the Lord. You hear these hints of these psalms in this book, and it is supposed to take you back to passages like this and bring into your mind these contexts. You hear a new song being sung, and you're supposed to think of Psalm 149. You say, ah, I know what this means, that there's a time of victory here. And notice the message that the Lord takes pleasure in his people. Let them exult in glory. God's going to save you. That's the message that they're singing and will sing then. It says also uh, in verse uh, 3 that no one could learn the song except the 144,000. That is that only the saints are going to share in this victory. Only God's people. And if you're not one of them, you don't join in the celebration. It is an exclusive group which compares to the people of the beast and the dragon. We saw another exclusive group in chapter 13. You don't have the mark of the beast on your right hand or your forehead. You can't buy or sell. You can't be one of us. You can't be part of our world. Well, God says it's that way with me too. Unless you are marked by me and have the name of God on your forehead, you can't be part of this group. And this is the group that is left standing when the battle is over. This is the group that is singing the victory song. We really don't have to ask what happened to the other group, although John is eventually going to show us the destruction of the enemy. But it's, it's amazing and it's comforting that John puts this up front. It's like John, as if he were saying, I don't want to make you wait to see what happens. I want you to know now what the end of the story is. So that as I tell you about the conflict, that you'll know that it's all going to be okay. Uh, these are the ones that have been purchased from the earth. We are told, and there's a lot of language like this in the Bible. Uh, in Acts 20, uh, Paul told the elders of Ephesus, be on guard for yourselves and the flock to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And Peter said that we've been purchased with the blood of a spotless lamb. In Psalm 74, remember your congregation which you have purchased of old. That is no doubt a reference to the Passover where the death of the Lamb redeemed them from the death of that night. God paid the blood. The Lamb paid the blood, the substitute for His people. And notice the reference to Zion there, this Mount Zion where you have dwelt. And Exodus 15, the song of Moses, after the Egyptians have drowned in the Red Sea, Moses breaks into song, you'll recall, in chapter 15. And in one of those verses, he says, Terror and dread fall upon them, that is, on the enemy. By the greatness of your arm, they are motionless as stone. The enemy's all dead. Until your people pass over, O Lord, until the people pass over whom you have purchased. So God purchased them out of Egypt, brought them over the sea into the place of safety. That's the picture that is described here. And they're singing the new song because they too have been purchased by the blood of the Lamb. And they're going to be okay, is the message. Um, John also tells us there in verse 3 that they have been purchased from the earth. And remember, the earth is not just the place where people live in the book of Revelation. It's the realm of evil. Those who dwell on the earth are unbelievers. The earth is the place that is dominated by Satan and his agents. It is the place of warfare. Remember the scene in chapter 12 that the woman goes into the wilderness on the earth, and there the battle takes place. It's often the same place that John calls the world. So there's a great picture, therefore, of victory and a coming joy. All right, uh, we are told four things about these people, four more things, I guess we should say, 
that is somewhat emphatic. These are the ones who have not been defiled uh, with women. Very often you'll see uh, suggestions in commentaries and so forth uh, that it means that they had not participated in some kind of cultic prostitution. And very often we see uh, the idea that pagan religion was coupled with prostitution. Uh, there's actually extremely little evidence for that. Uh, there may have been two places in the ancient world that actually did that. Uh, but as far as it being a widespread thing that all pagan temples had prostitutes, doesn't seem to be true, not at all. And it doesn't seem to me that John would throw that in here. There is no evidence whatsoever that there was any kind of prostitution involved in the emperor cult, none whatsoever. And so we might want to look uh, someplace else for the understanding of this. I think you could make a good case that this is a symbol of faithfulness. Uh, very often in the Bible, uh, sexual infidelity is a symbol of unfaithfulness. Sexual fidelity is considered a symbol of faithfulness to God. And so, don't have to remind you of Hosea's story and the graphic message that is portrayed in Hosea's own life, but also the language of Ezekiel 23 and Jeremiah 3. Think about Jeremiah 3, uh, where God says, I have a lawsuit against the inhabitants of the nation. They have been unfaithful to me since the day I married her. Uh, that idea that uh, she has defiled herself by being by worshiping other gods. Uh, that seems to fit the context here as well. Um, it says that they have kept themselves chaste. That is, that they are virgins. And this, again, is also an image that is used in the Bible of the people of God. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, Paul uses the image of the Corinthians there. I am jealous of you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. And Paul says, I'm afraid that maybe you haven't been too true to that. And then, of course, in Ephesians 5.27, the picture of the church of Christ presented as a bride in all of her purity without spot or blemish given to the Lord uh, on the day of his return. Uh, also, uh, that fits the context of the book of Revelation well. Uh, in Revelation 14 and verse 8, we're going to see one of the first images here of Rome as a harlot. It refers to this great city as... Uh, the one who has made the nations drink the wine of the passion of her immorality. Immorality in the New American Standard Bible usually translates the word fornication from the Greek. So the great evil empire is first here depicted as a harlot, and to worship the beast would be to uh, compromise oneself, be unfaithful to God with this harlot, and this fits along well with the uh, suggestion we have made about the book. So I want to suggest tonight that not defiled with women has nothing to do with literal fornication, but it means that they have not worshipped the emperor, that they have not worshipped this false god. Secondly, these are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Wherever. They are devoted, unconditionally so implying here that they have resisted the pressure to follow the world. And do you see anything ironic about that statement there in verse 4? They follow the lamb wherever he goes. What's strange about that? Yeah, lambs usually don't lead. They're usually the things that are led. And so the lamb leads them, uh, this great group of people. Uh, and there's a lot of that, of course, in John's writings. Thirdly, Verse 4, these have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Uh, some of you might have a Bible that says that they have been purchased by God and by the Lamb. 
that might actually be a better translation here. Um, but the point is that they are purchased as first fruits. And this is one of those places in the book where I think that uh, you and I are kind of grabbed and caught into the scene. The idea of the first fruits in the Old Testament was a very simple one. You planted, you let the rain do its work over the winter time, and then you waited. And then one day you get up and you see that the grape vines are beginning to produce their ripe grapes. The olive trees are putting forth olives. The wheat is beginning to mature. And some of it has already begun to come. That's called the first fruits, the first part of the crops that come in. And what it means is that the rest of the crop is on its way. It's kind of like when it's drizzling before a rainstorm. You know that the rain is coming because a little bit of it's already here. And Paul uses this imagery in 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus is the first fruits of them that are asleep. That he is the first one raised never to die again, but more are coming. You and I are going to join him in that. And the picture here is that these people have been purchased as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. God is going to gather them. And it introduces this harvest imagery that we're going to see in the rest of the chapter here. God is going to gather his people. He's going to gather some other things as well. But his people are going to be gathered unto him. And not just these. They're just the first fruits. That there is an entire harvest of souls that is coming. And if I understand what the Bible's telling us correctly, you and I are to be part of that great harvest, that we will join these people in this great celebration someday. Uh, but for them, it was to know that God is going to begin with you and, and spare you. And then fourthly, we are told in verse 5 that no lie was found in their mouth, that they are blameless. Is this a reference to their faith being tested? You may recall the letter... Uh, that was written by the Roman governor Pliny to the emperor Trajan. We've quoted this letter a time or two, but remember what he said in that letter as he's explaining these trials of Christians to the emperor. Others who were named by that informer at first confessed themselves Christians and then denied it. And then he goes on to talk about how some of them said they had quit a long time ago. They all worship your statues and the images of God's and cursed Christ. Uh, is that what is being described here? That they did not deny their faith. They did not tell the lie and say, no, I'm not a Christian. Rather, John says they are blameless. And that word is used in the Old Testament of sacrifices that were pure. And so here's a picture of people who were sacrificed for their faith. Pure. They went to their graves not having compromised, not having given up the faith, not having reneged on their great confession. Well then, uh, starting in verse 6, we have a series of three angels that takes the stage. Verse 6, I saw another angel flying in midheaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation, tribe, and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of waters. And remember what we have said before that John is not really telling us anything new. He's just telling us the same story in different pictures, different words. We've seen this before. Chapters 6, 7, 8, 9. Remember that series of judgments? There were the seven seals, and then there were the uh, seven trumpets, all announcing to the world that it's time to repent. And we finally saw at the end of chapter 9 that people just weren't going to repent, and God said, then that's it, I'm going to destroy this great evil nation. Well, here's that same picture. 
God is going to destroy this wicked empire, but he's not going to do it just by turning the lights out. He's going to give these people a chance. And the way he gives them a chance is by preaching the gospel to them. And so we have here the proclamation of the gospel. And again, this is not literal. There was no time in history when angels were flying around in the air speaking the gospel. It is simply an image that the gospel was going to go out all over the world. God was going to give these people a chance to hear the truth and to repent if they would. And it it flies in mid-heaven to where you can't miss it, and it speaks with a loud voice so that you can't but hear it. Uh, Paul says at the end of his life that through me the gospel was sufficiently preached. And by the end of the first century, even by the time of Paul's death in the early 60s, Just about everybody in the Roman Empire knew about the gospel. This was not something like Paul said to uh, to, uh, uh, Agrippa. This was not something that's been done in a corner. It was the most publicized doctrine and idea in the ancient world. And that's the picture that is given here, that God is going to announce the message far and wide and clearly. And it is a message of warning, a message of judgment, Fear God. Don't pay attention to these false gods. The true God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of waters, that God is the one that you ought to be listening to, not this fake God that sits in Rome. And so it is a message of warning and judgment. We hear the same kind of thing back in Matthew chapter 24, as Jesus describes there the... uh, Uh, what would happen before the destruction of Jerusalem. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. Then the end will come. Same kind of thing here. God's giving them a chance. But the fact is that Rome would not listen. Uh, You listen to Paul in Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 18, describing the society of his day. People who were insolent, without love, without natural affection, homosexuals, haters of good, you know the list as well as I do, Uh, they wouldn't listen to the truth. And so the only thing, therefore, for them is to reap judgment. And the, the message is that his judgment has come, you better repent while you can, but nobody was going to listen. And so the second angel, verse 8, another angel, a second one, followed saying, fallen, fallen, is Babylon the great. Because they wouldn't listen to the message, the only thing that is left for them is punishment. And that's just the way God deals with everybody, isn't it? God says, I'm going to tell you what I want. You're you're bound for destruction. Here's the way out of it. But if you won't listen, the only thing that's left for you is destruction. And so these people won't listen And therefore, the announcement is made that they're going to fall. The allusion here is to Isaiah 21.9. Isaiah says, Now behold, here comes a troop of riders, horsemen in pairs, and one said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon, and all the images of her gods are shattered on the ground. The gods in whom she trusted to save her and make her great, they're going to be destroyed. And it's in... This typical prophetic language, it's not Babylon will fall. It's, as far as God is concerned, it's already fallen. There's not going to be no doubt whatsoever about this. The fact that uh, the enemy is here referred to Babylon is significant. Babylon was remembered for a couple things. First of all, it was the city, Babel, that we read about in Genesis chapter 11, that was characterized by pride and arrogance and and wanting to exalt itself. And it was judged by God and did not succeed. It was also a place of great arrogance, pride, and evil. And it was the place where Israel spent some time in captivity and hardship. And so to refer to 
This empire as Babylon not only conjures up the wickedness and the arrogance of that ancient city and says that this new city is just like it, but it also tells us as readers that just like the ancient Babylon, this city is going to fall as well. Isaiah 13, 19, Babylon, the beauty of kingdoms, the glory of the Chaldeans' pride will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. We're going to see a picture like that here in just a moment. Jeremiah 51, 44, I will punish Bel in Babylon. That was the god of the Babylonians. And I will make what he has swallowed come out of his mouth. And the nations will no longer stream to him. Even the wall of Babylon has fallen down. And if you know anything about ancient Babylon, the Babylonians prided themselves on their city wall. Indestructible as far as they were concerned. God said, I can take it down. I can destroy this city. And that's what he would do. And so here in Revelation 14, fallen is Babylon. Nobody would have looked at the Roman Empire in the first century and said, oh yeah, it's going to fall. It was at the height of its power. And yet the message is, God says, I'm going to take it down. It's, it's destroyed as far as I'm concerned because it won't listen and it has infected the rest of the world with its own immorality. Um, calling the city Babylon not only compares Rome with Babylon, but it also sets the readers of John's book in parallel with Israel. People who lived in a foreign land, in conflict with pagan gods, who faced hardship and persecution, whose existence was threatened and yet held out a hope of future victory. And so there's still a message of encouragement in all of this. God saying, yes, this new city, Rome, is like Babylon. The good news is that you are like my Israel. And I saved her from Babylon, and I'm going to save you from this new Babylon. And so <clears throat> this is actually good news, just as it was back there in Isaiah's day. Uh, and again, fallen is not historical here. It doesn't mean that it's already fallen by this time, uh, it's the Lord simply saying, as far as I'm concerned, it's gone. Because she has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. This is going to set the scene for the great harvest scene in verses 14 and following, one of the bloodiest scenes in all the book, and it also introduces Rome as the great harlot. And so this imagery of harvesting grapes, harlotry. John's going to put it all together in a rather interesting way. And then the third angel sounds. <laughs> we can get started on this, I think. Got a minute here. Uh, another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives a mark in his forehead or on his hand, he will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. There you see in the photograph there a wine press with pure grape juice coming out. Uh, I've never seen that myself, but I'm told that it is a syrupy kind of stuff that comes out, not the stuff that you get in the bottles at the grocery store. And, of course, that's pretty strong stuff. The ancients, of course, would mix it with water before they drank it because it was just too strong to drink in its natural state like this. But God says here that if anybody is going to follow the beast, worship that image, involve themselves in this false idolatry, then he will drink of the wine of the wrath of God in full strength. No dilution. He's going to receive all of God's wrath. And so we have here the crux of the matter. God says it's either me or the emperor, but there's not room enough in this place for two gods. And <clears throat> he, of course, alludes to the beast and uh, the idolatry that we have suggested uh, that is represented there. And the warning is that if, if you get yourself caught up in this, then you're going to face the wrath of God and there will be no way of getting out of this. I think we're probably going to have to quit there. Our time is uh, up for tonight.
So we will pick up with about verse uh, 11 or so next time. Thank you again for your good uh, attention.